I'm not Jocko. I'm not Tim. You know, those guys pop out, pop out of bed and, and, you know, and, and immediately go into an air squat or a burpee, like literally every morning. And I've never sat back and said, all right, I'm, I'm a 55 year old, uh, I'm a 55 year old, five foot six guy of, of Welsh stock who was a fat baby because his mother overfed him. So, you know what? It's, I've had a good run. Uh, I'm just going to watch Netflix. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your hosts, Nate and Brian, are hanging out with you, and we are excited to have a new guest on the show today. Dr. Mike Simpson is going to be joining us. Doc. Yeah, Doc, as he likes to be called. And we're going to be talking to him about getting honed, uh, finding your edge over 40, which is a book that he wrote and also kind of a mentality that he carries. I got to tell you, Brian, this guy's resume is off the charts, but we'll get to that later for now. Uh, Let's check in with our quote. Do not go gently into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. Dylan Thomas. Very nice. I like that. Yeah. So Mike, Mike, Doc, as he likes to be called, <clears throat> um, his book, Finding Your Edge Over 40, is mostly a book about um, staying healthy, staying fit, staying committed, uh, setting and, and reaching goals, physically physical and otherwise. And I just thought this was a cool quote to go with it because I don't know. It seems like when I was a kid, when you got over 40 and over 50, like doc is, I think he's 55. Um, you were old. <laughs> like you were old when in the, in the eighties when you were 40 or 50. And that just does not seem to be the case these days. You got, well, I was just talking to, um, uh, some jujitsu guys who were in the what's it called like the masters tournament at worlds. They're like, I think it's over 45 black belts kicking the crap out of each other. It's just, it's just an, an amazing feat. And, and it uh, shows that we're, or some of us are choosing to be young longer. And it's pretty cool that we can do that. And doc's book is all about that. Choosing to be young longer. That is something that we can sure all benefit from Brian the trade is is a young man's game. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to just be a young man's game, but it's not typically friendly to the the feet, the knees, the elbows, the back, the lower back for sure, the shoulders. It's uh, plumbing plumbing for sure that I know um, can be pretty brutal on the body. And what we talk about quite a bit with uh, Doc is longevity like stretching your useful years physically. How can we do what we do even longer and, uh, you know, live to tell about it? How can we be somewhat more physically fit doing what we're doing, being in a truck, being at a desk, whatever it is? um, How can when you're 60, you don't feel like you're 80, you feel like you're 40? I got to tell you, there's some days... (laughs) Some days that my mind feels like it's 80. <laughs> does does he have any, days. does he have any exercises for that? As a matter of fact, <laughs> he does talk uh, supplements for that. So, yeah, man. Yeah. The book was, the book's a short read. Um, I want to say it was like two or three afternoons or afternoons, like after I got home from work evenings that it seemed like probably less than an hour a day for two or three days. And I was through that thing. Um, and it and it was packed full of really good uh, strategies for staying young longer. I don't know. For me, that was the that was the uh, phrase that I just kept ringing through my head when I was reading it. Is that you don't feel like you're sixty when you're forty. Feel like you're thirty when you're fifty. Um, and this is a way to do it. But it does take like active 
engagement on your part to not be physically aging fast, especially when you're in that truck all day or under sinks or in attics, crawl spaces, you know, swinging a pickaxe in a trench, what have you. Really easy to be so tired at the end of a day. You just go home and eat a bunch of sugar and crash in front of a TV and wake up, you know, 15 minutes before you have to leave for work and do it all again the next day. It's no need to get personal, Brian. <laughs> you you don't swing pickaxe, buddy. <laughs> nope. True. <laughs> the rest of that, though. <laughs> pop off like the potato head, man. Or what is it, Mr. Potato Head? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so um, I do I do want to apologize for my part of the quality of this. Uh, we're recording this intro um, after weeks after the podcast was recorded. Yeah, and not only that, the audio sucked too. But continue with the apology. That's what I'm saying. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh! You bet the. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm in Reunion, Florida, uh, with some new friends. And uh, Mr. Gene Slade and and uh, my uh, associate here, Mr. Mike Vavrick, and recording it on AirPods with a cell phone in a suite and had no service whatsoever. And this was such a massive house that we were staying in that um, the Wi-Fi was so far away from my room, I didn't have good Wi-Fi either, so... When you hear me speak, which is fairly rarely, thankfully. Yes, um, <laughs> yes, thankfully. <laughs> Agreed. Um, it's it's pretty bad quality audio, so there's there's not too much of it, fortunately. Um, and Doc takes the uh, takes the burden of conversation on himself in this episode, but um, it's it's good enough that you're not going to care. What Doc has to say is pretty phenomenal. Absolutely. And I'm a fan. I was I was already a fan. I actually listened to his podcast and um, watched him on the History Channel's Hunting Hitler with Tim Kennedy. So I always thought the guy was really cool. And we got some pretty cool tidbits about him and the show and, and his relationship with Tim, which was a funny story, which you'll hear. Yes. Make sure you catch that at the end of the episode. Yep. But, yeah, without further, further ado, we'll uh, bring in Doc, Dr. Mike Simpson. Hey, our guest today is Dr. Mike Simpson. He has served over three decades in the military as an airborne ranger, a special forces operator, and finally as a doctor of emergency medicine assigned to the Joint Special Operations Command, otherwise known as JSOC. Throughout his career, Mike has deployed to 17 different countries from counter-narcotic operations in the jungles of South America to the global war on terror in Southwest Asia and North Africa. Along the way, Mike has been trained as a demolitions expert, SWAT sniper, high altitude, low opening or halo parachutist, civilian paramedic, special forces medic, operations and intelligence sergeant, and finally a board certified emergency medicine physician. Mike is also a martial arts enthusiast who trains in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai. His passion for martial arts motivated him to become a practicing fight doctor. As one of the foremost experts in both tactical trauma medicine and combat sports medicine, Mike is highly sought after as a lecturer and instructor working extensively with the mixed martial arts fighters, law enforcement, and military organizations providing medical care and training. He also co-stars with Hunting Hitler with our buddy Tim Kennedy on the History Channel. And wow, are we super excited to have him on the show. So welcome, Mike. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Matt, I... I <laughs> That is one intense bio, and I'm trying to do the mental math on how many years uh, you have of experience there. I figure you have about like 150 years of experience that somehow you managed to pack into your life at this point. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 it just shows what you can look, do. Look younger than me and Nate. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that, man. I got, I got some, I got some battle scars. I guarantee my MRIs don't look younger than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can promise you that. But this is so. I think I'm a I'm a great example of what you can accomplish with a little little bit of uh, ADHD and a short man's complex. <laughs> oh man, wow! Like we could just spend an entire episode debriefing your resume here. Uh, it, it's just 
wow, one of the most intense things I've ever seen. Uh, but our show today is is focusing on a couple of things. Our audience um, is the home services professionals, so plumbers, HVAC techs, and electricians. And we wanted to get in touch with you because you have uh, an experience in so many different areas of of combat and and leadership development, and, and you know, kind of owning your future, becoming the master of where you're going. Um, and that's a that's a message that resonates to what we try to be here at the Waste Day podcast. Awesome. That's a great message. Yeah, not not to mention the, the book Honed, uh, Honed, H-O-N-E-D, Finding Your Edge Over 40. Um, our, our particular audience in the trade, we get, we get pretty beat up. Um, it's, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent. It's not quite as bad, but, you know, training mixed martial arts, except there is, there is no um, training you for the physicality of it. No, I mean, we're, we're largely an unhealthy trade um a lot of obesity a lot of lack of sleep a lot of um just beating yourself up and taxing yourself for years and years and and not really taking care of yourself and one thing i loved about the book was that i'll say two things it it can easily show us how to increase longevity over 40 certainly um but it but also i would say this to our listeners if you plan on being 40 one day it's still a good read because we can also, also we'll, we'll show. I mean, I'm I'm reading it in my basement. I got my 13 year old son coming up and down, and it, just every now and then I'd grab him like, "Hey, go check this out, buddy. This is something we need to start talking about." He's in he's in jujitsu and kickboxing and uh, wrestling and stuff, and he's uh, you know, like any 13 year old. Don't talk to me about stretching. No, no, no. they're <laughs> but, they're indestructible. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah. oh, rest, rest what? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, rest when I'm watching TV, but the, uh, active recovery and passive recovery and all these things that you talked about in the book were, were really, uh, eye opening for me. I mean, I've been working out for a long time and do a lot of passive recovery when I sleep every night, mm-hmm. but the active recovery stuff, I'm like, wow, when I was in a truck, I can't even imagine having all this info and insight, um, and how much better my body would feel right now because most days I feel like I got hit by a car. And I'm, you know, only 42. Yeah. No, that's, if you look and, you know, you talked about, you know, being, being in the truck and that's when, when I think uh, of, of what, you know, what most trades and what most trades people are doing, it's a lot of time in the truck and, and just that time in the truck, uh, aside from, you know, let's not even get into the, uh, there is no proper ergonomic way to get into an attic with a tool belt and with replacement parts and crawling <laughs> and, and lifting water heaters, you know, uh, you know, power units, you know, chillers, whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, getting to the main, uh, doing all this stuff, you're in terrible position for, for, uh, for physical movement to begin with, right? Uh, that it is, is going to make you prone to injuries and, it, it, it's just, it's a not physically, it's a nightmare. And the schedule, you know, the, you know, trying to grab food when you can, everything else. I, I do, uh, I, I know what that's like. And it, it's, uh, you know, doing it over years, it's just kind of compounds everything. Uh, probably the, the single best thing that anybody could do in that line of work is, uh, you know, if their boss would actually invest in, in a real ergonomic driver's seat just for them to be sitting in going from job to job that would probably be the single biggest factor that could help people with their health. Cause I guarantee that that spine health in, in your community is just probably atro- as atrocious as it is in the military. All right. So uh, Dr. Simpson, or as uh, I believe you prefer to be called just doc uh, let's, let's kind of start off with your history. I mean, where did you start and you know, what was, what was life like for you growing up? Did, were you, did you start and enroll in the military at age three? Cause uh, again, I'm just looking at that resume, but, uh, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about your past and what you got, what got you to be who you are today. And we'll jump in from there. Yeah. So I, uh, I was born in Redondo beach, California. I spent my formative years in a little town called Tehachapi. So it was a very working class upbringing, um, in a small town style, you know, wa- walking down the, the middle of Main Street with a 22 rifle over my shoulder on my way to go across the railroad tracks and out to the fields and, you know, shoot 
doves or coyotes or uh, <laughs> rabbits. Uh, and uh, that's, to me, that was completely normal. And uh, somewhere around early high school, I started having an eye for the military. Um, two weeks after graduation, uh, I shipped off on a, on a ranger contract. I did my first four years in uh, first ranger battalion. This was 1984 time frame. So uh, Ronald Reagan was in the White House. Uh, did four years there. Thought I wanted to get out and uh, maybe pursue a career in law enforcement. So uh, I got out, enrolled in college, was working as a corrections officer at night. My unit, uh, I was in a National Guard unit because I, I did still enjoy jumping out of airplanes and doing stuff like that. So there was a Special Forces Guard unit down the road in Florida. I was living in Georgia at the time. And uh, we got mobilized for Desert Storm, Desert Shield. We didn't deploy overseas, uh, but we got uh, called back to duty. And while I was called back to duty, that was my opportunity to go to Special Forces Assessment selection, to go to the Q course, uh, to go to language school. And I decided, well, I really missed being in the military. This is probably what's for me. I wasn't really enjoying college very much. Um, I certainly didn't like being a corrections officer. Um, and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is, this is my life. This is what I'm going to come back to. So I went back on active duty full time. I went to seventh special forces group, uh, as an 18 Charlie special forces engineer, did that for a few years, wanted a, wanted a, a bigger challenge. So I went to the medic course, came back to a team as a, as a medic and did that. And at that point, that was when I realized that I really like medicine. And mm-hmm. this is a bit of a calling for me, especially military trauma medicine. So I uh, decided that I was eventually going to go to either PA school or medical school. And they made my decision for me. They told me I had too many years of service and I was too old to go to the Army PA program. So I applied to medical school and was accepted. Um, after medical school, I did emergency medicine residency in San Antonio. And I was a uh, little over halfway through that residency when I got the call from uh, from an old friend who was who was now at JSOC asking me if I wanted a job back at Fort Bragg at JSOC. And I jumped at that opportunity because it really is absolutely the best job for a physician in uniform. Bar none, I, I don't care. I, I'll, I'll fight anybody that says different. Um, did six years in the unit, uh, five deployments, and uh, then I retired out of Fort Hood. Uh, here in Texas, and started working uh, on the civilian side as an EM physician. That's also the time frame. A uh, little bit before that, I started working as a fight physician, and then uh, all that kind of led me into uh, working as a SWAT physician as well. So uh, that's what I do here in Central Texas. And then, of course, uh, started my own business during COVID, uh, which which is what ultimately led to the book. Wow. What, what business is that, <laughs> Doc? So I have a book called Graybeard Performance. So it's a life and lifestyle brand, brand for guys over 40 who still want to be savages, still want to kick ass. You know, this isn't, uh, this isn't your, your dad or your granddad's uh, multivitamin and supplement. This isn't Geritol. This isn't Centrum Silver. Uh, I'll probably get sued for mentioning their names. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, no, nobody's going to hear it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You know, this is, I, I realize that there are guys that, uh, although my, my journey is, is a little bit unique, the questions that I had to answer for myself and the things that I want to do, there's a, there's a lot of guys over 40, you know, we're not, we're not like our dads and our granddads were at this age. You know, I talk about, you, you saw that in the first part of the book, I talk about me doing stuff at 48. If somebody told me when I was in my late teens, early twenties, Hey, you're, what if your dad did this? I would, I would just laugh. I would, it was a complete impossibility. That's an old man. Uh, you know, and, and at 55, the, the things that I do and I think about what, I, you know, I think, I think I'm older than Wilford Brimley does was when he did cocoon at this point, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm doing, you know, strength and conditioning workouts five days a week. I'm doing jujitsu or MMA two to two to three days, sometimes even four days a week. Uh, I'm putting on full kit and, and going out with the operators and, uh, you know, we, we served a warrant two days ago, uh, going to the range, doing all the physical requirements. Um, and I, I wanted to speak to that crowd that still wants to be active and do that, um, even if they're not doing it already. And I, and I knew that they needed a roadmap and they needed some help. So I came up with a supplement line, my grade performance supplement line, and uh, that worked in conjunction with me uh, writing the book, Honed, which is basically uh, all the lessons learned that I have the scars and the, and the CT scans to prove. Uh, and, and how you can avoid it and be healthy, fit, and like I say, still be 
a complete savage at age 40, age 50, age 60. I love that, Doc. And that certainly aligns up with kind of our, our mentality here at Waste No Day. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out how you fit 27 hours of activity into 24 hours uh, and, and not <laughs> sleeping. But you know, let, let's, start, let's start at that concept there. So, I mean, every day we're trying to get ourselves better. And, and in our world, that yeah. means becoming better technically, learning our craft mm-hmm. better. It means uh, communication, learning how to speak to a homeowner better. And it means mm-hmm. at home too, because, you know, we can't just be all we can be at work and then go home and slack off. Like it's, it's all around the yeah. table. And so as you look back over your career, what were some of the foundational moments in your life or, or the, the changes or, or experiences that, that drove home the fact that you need to get better and that you need to do something every day that's challenging you? You know, it, it, it definitely started as a, as a private uh, in Ranger Regiment. It's, uh, you know, I didn't, I wasn't particularly challenged by basic training. In fact, I don't, I wouldn't say I was challenged at all by basic training. I wasn't challenged in airborne school. Uh, you didn't run all that fast. The things that you were doing weren't all that complex. Um, it was, you know, basically it was overcoming, getting over your fear of jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft. That was you know, right. the biggest issue in airborne right. school. Then when I got, and all along, I was thinking, this isn't, this isn't what, like what I saw in the movies. This isn't, I haven't been, really been challenged yet. You know, I'm in a little bit, you know, I did a little bit more physical activity and basic training than maybe I otherwise would have done in a summer. But, uh, but I played sports in school, even though I was terrible. Um, but when I got to regiment, everything changed. Now it's like, here is the standard and you will meet this standard or you will go somewhere else. And every day you will be reminded of that. And, you know, you're, you know, the title of this podcast is Waste No Day. And, I, and Ranger Regiment really epitomizes that. You know, you're, you're up every day. Um, you're doing physical training every day, getting in better shape every day. You're getting tactically and technically more proficient every day. And this includes uh, Ranger Regiment is probably one of the only units that when you, you go out in the field for a week, um, you know, you, you wake up in a tactical perimeter in the morning. And uh, your squad leader come around and go, all right, you know, we're calling a, a tactical timeout. Everybody, uh, go ahead and go ahead and ground your your gear and uh, come over here. We're going to do some stretching. We're going to do some exercises, and we're gonna we're gonna run down the road and do some burpees and then run back. Uh, and then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna say, you know, game on again, and we're gonna be tactical again from that point. So uh, you really have to maximize. I would say, you know, maximizing what you can control and uh, just figuring a workaround for things that you can't control. You know, you can't control how many days you got to be at work today. You can't control uh, how many times you got to go up and down those attic stairs or down into the crawl space or, you know, how you know how much you ride in the truck. What you can control, how much sleep you got the night before, what you're putting into your body that morning and during the day, you know, what you choose to eat, um, what you do on the breaks that you do have, you know, are you, are you, are you using that time to be on your phone and scan social media? Or maybe are you sitting down doing some stretching and re- are reading up and planning for some stuff that you can do to better yourself physically and mentally. So you, you have to, uh, there's the, the mentality that I saw both militarily as an operator and as a physician is if you start getting really wrapped up in the things you can't control then uh, you're just you're just wasting brain energy and you're 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 wasting adrenaline on that. Just look at the things you can control. Try to maximize that, um, and everything else is, is going to sort itself out. So, did that become like an addiction for you in, in a way that, like, once you kind of got got that experience of like challenging yourself and then overcoming it and challenging yourself and again and overcoming it, like, did that just become? built into your DNA or, or do you even now still have days where you wake up and kind of have to, you know, fight back the lazy, the lazy you inside? Oh, oh, sure. Oh, I have it all. I have it all the time. And, and I'll tell you, um, I've had, uh, I've had some challenges just over the past same month and a half. So, uh, and, and I, and literally 30 minutes before coming up here to record with you guys, it's Friday morning. I step on the scale every Friday morning. Um, and I'm five pounds up from where I was about a month, month and a half ago. And I know, and I know that's not muscle. I haven't been doing a lot of powerlifting, right? 
Um, and w- here we are about to enter, you know, Thanksgiving week and the holiday season. <laughs> right. So, so I've got a little concern on that, but, and I know all that's on me. That's, you know, that's, I made some, uh, I made some choices on a couple of days that maybe, uh, I'm not, it, it, it yeah, it would have been inconvenient because I was, I was traveling or, uh, I was a little bit banged up, but honestly, I, I, I could have made a little bit more effort and, and I didn't. So you're going to have days like that. You're going to have days where you say, you know what, I could have done more this day or this week, and I didn't, okay? But, you know, be honest with yourself about that. Be honest about where the blame lies for that, which is with you, not with anybody else, not with not with the world around you, and, and you deal accordingly. But, yeah, there's these, I, uh, which day was it this week? Tuesday of this week. Um, I didn't feel like going to the gym, and uh, it was uh, – a little bit later in the morning than normal, and I was still walking around with a cup of coffee. And when I said, "You're not going to the gym today," I said, "No, you know what? I'm just not. Uh, I'm just not feeling it today." And she said, "Are you planning on going to the jujitsu tonight?" Because she always asks, because that's how she she plans our, our dinner meal time frame. And I said, uh, I, "I don't know. I'll see. I'll see how I feel." And about thirty minutes later, those that conversation kept replaying itself in my head. And thirty minutes later, I was dressed for the gym and I was driving to the gym. Hmm. And, and while driving to the gym, I made a pact with myself that going to jiu-jitsu that night was not going to be negotiable. That because I didn't feel like it, that I, that was all the more reason that I was going to go. Well, it's refreshing to hear that somebody with your extensive experience and who's literally written a book about, you know, challenging yourself to become better also has days like that. <laughs> so thanks for sharing. Yeah, and I, I hope that people will identify with that because you know I'm not uh, I'm not Jocko I'm not Tim you know <laughs> those those guys pop out pop out of bed and and you know and, and immediately go into an air squat or a burpee like literally every morning and you know and they're up <laughs> three hours before me and that's a, you know that's a combination of how they're how they're wired in their brain and and uh, and and genetic how they are physiologically on a genetic level and I'm not that way you know it's um, I've I've had to, to overcome some stuff but I have never I've never sat back and said all right I'm I'm a 55 year old uh, I'm a 55 year old 5 foot 6 guy of of Welsh stock who was a fat baby because his mother overfed him. So, you know what? It's, I've had a good run. Uh, I'm just going to watch Netflix. You know, once you... Well, sounds yeah, like a plan, was, buddy. I'll meet you. Yeah, it sounds like a great day, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you get it, you know. And I talk, also, you know, I talk about in the book, I love bacon cheeseburgers. I love pizza. You know, uh, I love, you know, it's. I was, I was physically present with Tim Kennedy when he ate his first slice of pizza he'd had in 10 years, right? Because he looked at stuff like that, like poison. I look at stuff like that, like, hey, hey, there's capers on this? Awesome. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not some genetic super freak. I'm not, uh, I'm not Goggins. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not that level of obsession. I, I just know that to have a good quality of life, that, you know, success and health is on the other side of hard work. And I, I want to do that. So in order to enjoy the things that I really want to enjoy and have the longevity that I want to enjoy, I need to do these things. And uh, it's it's a switch that you flip in your in your brain, and you know ninety percent of the time I'm thoroughly enjoying it, getting uh, my behind handed to me on a physical level in the gym, in the training room, on the mat. Um, you know, and, and it really is true that nobody's ever driven home been on the been on the drive home for a workout saying, "Man, I really I wish I wish I would have done that today. I really should have just sat at home and uh, and ate popcorn." Nobody right. says that. Right. Nobody. So you have to, you have to show up. And that's, uh, that's a little bit of an argument. We could, we could go down a rabbit hole, but that's a little bit of an argument, uh, against why, uh, uh, home gyms have a little bit of a detraction, right? Cause you're already there. So, uh, so it's a little bit easier to get distracted. Actually, in, uh, one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's first books, he actually talked about that, that, that why home gyms, uh, uh, are, are not, not a good thing if you, if you want to be serious about your fitness. Yeah, it's almost impossible not to get distracted at home with the home gym. With yeah, both both Nate and myself have four kids. Not that Nate would ever touch a weight, or anything, uh, but thanks, Brian. Myself certainly. Yeah, with the four kids <laughs> and like everything you have going on, even get up to get up at four fifteen and lift like I I do. I mm-hmm. find myself tinkering in the basement 
with things that have nothing to do with my workout. And, you know, despite having gym equipment, still find that I need to go to the gym. Yeah. It's just, you know, you, you get away from that. It's, it's much like sleep, you know, you know, sleep, you have to, you have to cultivate your, your, your bedroom as a sleep space so that men, men, on a mental level, you know, on a subconscious level, your body knows this is the place where we sleep, not the place where we, uh, where we make memes, not the place where we eat a three course meal, uh, not the place where we, you know, whatever, you know, this is the place where we are intimate with our partner and where we sleep. And, uh, your basement isn't necessarily that way. This is the place where we store Christmas decorations and, oh, there's some weight. The garage, this is the place where the car is and, oh, there's, you know, there's uh, a heavy bag. But the gym is, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a house of learned doctors. This is a place where, you know, you go to get fit, right? And your brain knows that and you flip that switch. You know, it's a really interesting concept. And, and I wonder how much we fall into the trap of allowing those types of multi-purpose usability to infect us. You know, for example, uh, take, take the car, right? So a fair amount of the people that listen to this show literally spend, I don't know, three, four hours on the road a day. Not because they want to, but because their jobs yeah. are spread across territory and they have to drive from house to house. And, and mm -hmm. what, what does that environment teach you when you hop in that truck, right? Well, for, for many of us, you know, we flip on the radio, we grab a bag of chips or a soda, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're multitasking, eating. It's, it's the place of comfort. And I wonder, mm -hmm. like, man, how, can we train ourselves out of that? Uh, we've we've actually done an entire podcast on MVU or My Vehicle University and basically trying to make mm. the drive time, the learn time, because, you know, you, when you're in front of the homeowner, you, you can't learn at that point or, uh, you, you know, actively learn, I should say, but like not you can't research, you can't sit back and decompress, you can't review anything, you're you're in the moment. But just like you would do in a, in a post-op surgery or something like that, where you review everything that just happened, that's what we want for the people in the field to be doing in the drive time. And I wonder if, if we don't need to kind of uh, cleanse, so to speak, the truck. Yeah. No, there, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, it's, you know, because uh, what's, what's the truck typically, when you think of the truck, right, you mentioned there's probably a couple of crinkled bag of chips on the floorboard, right? There might be, depending on who's, who, depending on whose truck it is, there might be a spit cup in the center console, right? <laughs> yeah. Probably, truck. You know, probably some soda cans, uh, yeah, and, and some other stuff. But, it, and it's funny that you mentioned that because, because I have a little bit of a psychological tie to, to long drives in the same manner. I start to crave junk food when I'm on a long drive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Texas, we have this, we have Bucky's, which are these amazing, uh, gigantic, uh, gas stations that have all this food that's terrible for you. Uh, and, uh, pecan pralines and all these other, you know, uh, these, all these other things, this full aisle. And I start driving and I start craving, I, I, I start craving things like Reese's peanut butter cups when I'm, when I'm on a long drive. And, you know, it's like, I, I want to grab a, a Coke Zero and, uh, and a Reese's or a Snickers bar or something like that. So I have to make a conscious effort to, uh, okay, I'm going on a long drive. I'm going to fill up my water bottle. I am going to, you know, I'm going to fill up my Yeti with coffee. But I'm going to take uh, a bag of almonds from my pantry, right? So, so I can eat something. I'm still going to snack, but it's going to be something that's a little bit more healthy. So I don't, when I do have to stop for gas and to use the bathroom, and I'm walking down that, that, that aisle of shame that just always goes from the men's room right back to the cashier <laughs> or to the front door, right? That's why that has, that. Uh, yeah, even it, it. yeah, that has gummy worms and everything else on it. You know, it's, it, 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 you know, I, I can put my head down and not look left and right and make it back out to my vehicle, know that I've got something a little bit healthier that I can munch on while I'm on the road. Now, a, a minute ago, you mentioned uh, Ted Kennedy and Jocko, and man, we're big fans of them, of course, and the mentality that they bring. But you you kind of separated yourself as different, you know, and, and I appreciate that because sometimes it's, you look at guys like that and you're just like, I mean, they're freaks, you know, like mm -hmm. how, how can you do that just day in and day out, like and never have a moment off. And so I appreciate, mm -hmm. I appreciate you kind of bringing up the fact that you have to actually get yourself into that mentality and you have to check yourself when you start, start straying from that. And so I want to ask you the question, you know, if, if you're speaking to somebody who's listening right now, what is the best way that they can become aware 
of the fact that they are giving into that lesser ideal that that they're surrendering a piece of themselves you know like you did in that story that you shared there where you realized like a half hour later oh my goodness you know i i just I just subjugated myself to a cup of coffee and comfort as opposed to pushing mm-hmm. myself to do something more. So if I'm already in that habit and I've been living in that habit for months and months or maybe even years, you know, what is it that can draw awareness or kind of snap to uh, back to reality about some things that need to change? Yeah. Well, I think the, the biggest thing would be, you know, ask yourself, you, ha- you have to have a plan. You can't, uh, you know, it's, we live <laughs> we live in a society. I know that's like a cliche term. We live in a society where, um, oh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, time, time is at a premium. You know, uh, you, you spend a lot of time at, you know, a, 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 I'm doing air quotes over here. A 40 hour work week doesn't exist for, for anybody I know, right? Everybody's worth putting in more time than that. So you got your work week, you got, uh, you know, uh, ancillary things that you have to take care of on the way that add to that, you know, like getting gas, picking up groceries, picking up a, a gallon of milk on the way home. Um, the, the time that you need to spend sleeping, personal hygiene, family, uh, eating, everything else. And, and this all adds up. So time, time is a tremendous premium. Time is the one thing we just can't get more of. We can't buy it. Um, so you got to look, look at your time and, and see if you're maximizing the use of it. And then, make that conscious decision that I am going to set aside time and uh, every day I'm going to have a plan because you have to have a plan. If you don't have a plan because time is so important, th- it's going to fall through the cracks. If you say I'm going to wing it when I can, that's just not going to work, especially at our age. So, you know, have a concrete plan that from this time to this time every day, I'm going to engage in some type of activity that's just going to make me a little bit better, a little bit healthier. Um, and that might be, you know, if, if you're on the job all day, maybe that's just stretching or maybe that's just some air squats uh, or maybe it's, you know, listening to a podcast that's going to give you a plan for, for what you're going to do uh, over the weekend. But, you know, invest, invest an hour a day into yourself and your mental and physical and spiritual well-being uh, and, and be, be air quotes selfish about that. And that's, a phrase that I heard some time ago, and I talked about it when I was on the John Bartolo show, is um, self-care is not selfish, okay? If I'm doing self-care, uh, I'm better at my job. I'm a better uh, father to my kids. I'm a better uh, lover and spouse to, to my wife. Uh, all of these things are important. You're just a better uh, all-around person. You're a better example to the people in, in your church or in your neighborhood. So recognize that say, say, taking, staking out an hour every day and say, this is for me. This is for me so I can work out or, or learn about something that I need to learn about to make myself a better person. And it's progress over perfection. You're going to get 1% better every day. As long as you are consistent over a period of time, you will get results. If you do it in fits and starts and you're like, oh, I really tried for a week because it was January and I made a new year's resolution. Um, and then you're like, okay, then, you know, I got distracted by a shiny object or I got sore or I got hurt. And now five weeks go by and I don't do anything. Uh, you know, doing that every so often is just going to get you injured. Whereas if you're consistently doing something, even if it's just walking, you know, walking or uh, holding a plank position, you know, th- these are all, uh, all gateway drugs into better health. <laughs> I love that. Before, before we move on too fast, uh, you said listening to a good podcast that gets you in the zone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did want to bring up the Mind of the Warrior podcast, which is it's called Mind of the Warrior with Dr. Mike Simpson, which is Doc's uh, podcast. A great show. Uh, he only Thank records you. about once every six months, unfortunately. I, yeah, I knew you were going to get so, that zinger in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, get, I get so much flack from, you know, from listeners. It's just... Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make excuses. It's on me. And I do, every time I come to it, when I do record, I say, all right, you know, hey guys, it's on me. It's, uh, but, uh, and I need to get back to that. I, and I was just thinking about that last night. I was thinking about, there's some people that have made verbal agreements to be on. And I, uh, I'm hoping to turn it around. 2022, I think, is gonna be a more consistent year for me when it comes to podcasts. Is that the one where you're gonna go weekly? 
Yeah, I, that's my plan. It's, I was weekly for a while, and, and I, I want to get, you know, I, I think that what I'm just going to have to do is get back to weekly, even if it's like I sit down and turn on the, the microphone and, and do, without any idea of what I was going to talk about and just start talking. Yeah, that, that is, uh, I mean, I do appreciate when you say, hey, I know it's been a while, but honestly, I don't have much to talk about, so I'm not just going to get on here and ramble. But at yeah. the same time, you getting on and rambling, in my opinion, who didn't grow up around anybody motivating or, you know, anything motivational, you rambling is like gold to so many people that, that are probably listening to your podcast. So I would definitely encourage you to just start spouting off more. <laughs> Well, you know, I really needed to hear that. So I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I get, I get a lot out of that podcast and got a lot out of your book. And uh, I would, yeah, I would definitely love to hear more. And we're not afraid to promote podcasts on, on our show. I mean, we only do an hour a week, hour and a half, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we, what I don't want is for our audience to turn, you know, finish our episode and then have the whole rest of the work week to listen to the news or music or yeah. whatever's polluting their mind on the radio. So yeah. by all means, pick, pick up uh, uh, Doc's podcast and start listening to it. Thank you. I appreciate the plug. Yeah, Doc, it's interesting what you said there uh, about being selfish about that. And uh, Listen, I'm sure there's a line to be drawn as, as far as when you actually do become selfish on things. But I think what you're really talking about is, is protecting the things that matter. I was having a conversation yeah. with a woman uh, a little bit ago and um, her job was very intense and uh, she was actually working as a, as a pastor in a church. And <clears throat> when COVID hit, sorry, before COVID, you know, she was working like six days a week, which, you know, inevitably turns into like seven days a week. But when COVID hit mm -hmm. and like churches kind of shut down and everything went online, like all of her deadlines got moved up. And so what used to be an all week long preparation for Sunday now turned into like a three day preparation for Wednesday or Thursday, because mm -hmm. that's, that's when all the, uh, the video and all the notes had to be in. And then she was left with like this Friday that was supposed to be a day off, but had never really become that. But because of the schedule change, it turned into that. And so she actually dedicated it to doing uh, one of her personal hobbies, which was quilting. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then COVID kind of, you know, loosened up and everything kind of got back to it. But she said that she has made every effort that she could to protect that time on Fridays to that hobby, to that, you know, that little thing that was, uh, was a value to her because something finally forced her to realize like, this is important. And, and like, I, I appreciate what you're sharing there that if we're not careful life will absolutely take over any spare moment that we have. It will drain every ounce of energy that we have out of ourselves and put it towards anything else. Many of those things being complete waste. And so we have yeah. to, we have to be intentional with dedicating that self-development, uh, self-reflection, challenging times into our schedule. We have to be intentional with doing that or it will not happen. 100%. 100%. It, 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 that's the mindset that you have to have. And that's why I, you know, I talk about in one of the early chapters of my book about uh, what I call the warrior athlete mentality. That if you look at health and fitness, uh, most people look at health and fitness as one of two ways either as a chore or as a hobby that they kind of dabble in, right? Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I go, you know, I, I showed up, I went to the gym. I probably, I stood around and talked to my friends for most of it, but I was there. Yeah. Uh, or it's, you know, hey, attendance either, is nine uh, tenths, right? Attendance is nine tenths of the, of the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's, it should be anyway. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the other way that people look at it is, you know, just again, that it's a chore that, you know, you hear, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have, I guess I'm going to have to just bump this, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have, you know, it's we can't look at it that way look at it you know the way a warrior going to battle looks at it that this is this is what i do this is my focus my focus is on personal health and readiness so uh you know once you flip that switch this is my my mission in life is to be healthy and so every day uh, you know today you know you lay in bed every night and you ask yourself am i a slightly better version of myself today than i was the day before and uh and a, and a warrior wants to say yes to that 
right? Every, every single time, every single night. And uh, that's the way that you have to, you have to flip that switch and look at it and, and, and parcel that time out like this, like that lady did. I hope uh, there's a lot of lessons learned coming out of COVID and a lot of things, you know, I, I, this should, this should have been, it is to some extent, but not to the extent it should have been a wake up call because of the comorbidities for the people that were worse, that right. were worse affected yeah. with COVID. Yep. That should have been a wake up call to everybody that, wow, I don't want to have those comorbidities. So now I'm going to start paying greater attention to my health. Right. Especially during the time period that we were on lockdown, you know, that, that, you know, Rather than channel surfing, you know, do air squats, do burpees, do push-ups, do planks. Um, and a lot of people did. Not as many as I would have liked, but a lot of people did. Uh, but we need, to, we need to come out of COVID kind of keeping the good things that we learned about ourselves, about kind of where the holes were. Uh, like in the state of Texas, we're keeping the fact that restaurants can serve takeout alcohol. I think that's a great thing to keep. Uh, it's like, you know, going to pick up your, your tacos and, and take them to margaritas home. That's awesome. Um, and just like that lady has learned, that, you know, we're going to keep this quilting time every week. You know, uh, hopefully everybody picked up some habits in COVID that they say, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep this. You know, I've, I've learned what's really important and, and I'm, I'm going to protect this going forward. And so much of that is mentality. And in fact, uh, just the other day, one of my friends shared with me, you know, changing the mentality from I have to, to I get to makes such a difference. Mm, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, huge. How many times do we say, Oh, you know, I have to go to the gym or, you know, in, in, in my personal experience, you know, I say, Oh, you know, we have to go to church kids. Uh, and I'm like, man, I, I gotta, I gotta stop saying that. That's not really how I feel. And it, it's not how I want to express that either. Like we get to, we get to do this and that does yeah. make a difference. Totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you mentioned earlier, did a lot to kind of change that mindset back in, um, what was it? Was it Pumping Iron? Is that the documentary? You did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I don't know, like 78 or something. Yeah. When uh, just talked about how everybody was, everybody was in the gym grunting and making silly faces and looking like they hated being there. And he always had a smile on his face because of how fortunate he is to be where he's at and what he's doing. Uh, I probably don't want to go into too much detail on that, but the uh, thing that he said was how, how great the pump felt, you know? And yeah, it's so true. It's, it's like, you, you might be a seven heading to the gym and thinking about getting there might put you at a six. You may have been walking out swollen and beat and sweating and just exhausted. You're an absolute ten. I, mean, I can't get any any better than when I'm walking out of the gym. Yeah. So maybe focus a little more on uh, what has to be done and a little more or a little less on what has to be done. A little more on the after effect is a good way to get started. Yeah. You know, and and that starts, you know, I, t I talk about in one of the very early chapters of my book, I talk about sleep. And I, I guarantee uh, a lot of your listeners are sleep deprived. I mean, the majority of Americans are sleep deprived. And especially people in the trades are sleep deprived. And the problem is exactly what you illustrated, is we look at sleep as this impediment, as this thing that we have to do. And you, you hear the phrase all the time, if only I didn't have to sleep, I could accomplish so much more, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's yeah. only so many hours in the day. Well, you need people need to stop sleep sleep is a bonus so it's not it's not you okay first of all you do have to sleep so just stop having that conversation right and and second sleep is a gift you know you get to power down completely your body gets to heal you get to learn things because that's when everything goes into your permanent memory your nervous system gets cleansed of all the toxins that have built up during the day you get to reset readjust and awake feeling better, right? So stop looking at it as a as I have to get some sleep and okay, hey, guess what? I get to, I have a bed with a roof over my head in a climate controlled environment where I get to get down and completely rest and recover. I, I'm basically getting a spa treatment for, for eight to nine hours. And that's how you have to look at it. Hmm. Now doc, earlier you mentioned that we need to have a plan. Like we need to have a plan yeah. for a day. We need to have a plan for a week, plan for a weekend, plan for our evenings, lives, whatever it is. Was there ever a time in your life when you didn't have a plan? 
Yeah, so the uh, probably the, the thing that immediately came to mind when you said that was uh, the first time I made an attempt at college. Um, I never had a good study plan. I didn't have a plan. I was I my plan was to get a degree, which is I think I picked psychology kind of out of a hat, and then I considered, you know, well, do I want to do sociology or criminal criminology? You know, I can go back and forth. Uh, because I, I was, all I wanted was something to hang on my wall so I could get a job in federal law enforcement someday. So that, I, I wasn't planning on, I wasn't there to learn anything. I was there to get a piece of paper. So I didn't really have a plan. And then, and then that, that trickled all the way down to me not having a plan from semester to semester to, you know, how I was going to map this journey out. Uh, and week to week, me not, having a good plan for how I was going to, uh, you know, study the material and everything else. Because I figured I show up, I, I put my, my, my bottom in the seat and I pay attention and I read the chapters they tell me and just, yeah, yeah, whatever, just, you know, this is, this is all just a, a way towards getting my degree. But I didn't have a plan and I had terrible grades, uh, my, my first year in college. Well, and I mean, I'm terrible, you know, I had, I had C's and B's for most, I did actually have one D, um, uh, which is a whole story in and of itself. Um, later, when I went back to get to get my undergrad, because I knew I wanted to go to medical school, um, I did three years of college in a year and a half, going to night school with a plan of I'm going to take these courses in this order because I need to learn these subjects, not to prepare me for medical school and also to prepare me for the MCAT. Uh, and, and this is the way that I'm, and I mapped it way out and I was disciplined with my, my study time and, 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 and parceling that off and being uh, very stingy with my study time. So I had a plan. So I went from being a very mediocre college student who got a, a D in, in one class to being a 4.0 college student. And because the, the, because of the time that it elapsed when those credits transferred from my, my previous school, I was able to, to graduate summa uh, at the top of my class because uh, I had a 4.0 average. Wow. So same guy, same guy, right? You know, mentally, I'm not any different. I didn't get any smarter during that time. I just had a plan and I was disciplined about that plan. Uh, and it made a huge difference. Same, same with, uh, you know, my fitness, especially over the last, say, two years, there was a time where I ballooned up to right around 200 pounds because I wasn't planning my diet. I was going to the gym, but I was very passive about it. Uh, I would show up at the gym and I would open up the app and see what my coach had programmed in and I would do the workout and I would, and then I would just go home. Um, I wasn't planning other activities around it. Um, I wasn't planning my active recovery days or my passive recovery days. And once I started doing that and planning my meals, planning my recovery days, and really planning what I was going to do each and every day to be a little bit more healthy, 30 pounds came off and, and I was uh, a lot more fit and, uh, and things just worked better. I, I love that, uh, that total change of who you were. And, and it makes me wonder, so, you know, I'm sure a fair amount of our listeners don't have plans, right? And and you, there you are sharing a story of how you were in that exact same place. And then I hear you say, oh yeah, but then I moved into doing three years of college and a year and a half graduated 4.0 summa and like everything was wonderful. And that just seems like a massive, a massive leap. Like there's a, there's a chasm between this version of myself and that version of myself and there ain't no bridge across it. So help me and everybody else understand who's, you know, if we're, if we're lacking on the plan, and yet that seems like too far off as something that is impossible at this point. What's, what's that first step that we should be taking to start building that bridge? Yeah. So the, the first step is getting over the hurdle of thinking that, thinking that you, the, thinking that that plan and what you do is dictated by anyone other than you. Right. Because when, when somebody wants to have a plan, so what are they thinking about? First of all is, uh, well, all right, I've got to show up at work this many hours a week. Cause I got, I got to get paid. And my boss is the one that dictates that the job is the one that dictates that. And then my family commitments are this, this, and this. 
I don't dictate that. You know, that, that's, that's, that's my role. That's dictator. So I don't have a lot of control. No, that's BS. You do have control, right? You don't have control. Yeah, you got to go do those things. But what you're doing for every second of every day outside of that, you absolutely have control over. And you have control over whether you waste your time, which is the most important thing. So, uh, cause the two biggest excuses I get about health all the time are, are money and time. Uh, and so well, I'll talk about the money aspect of it in a second, but when it comes to the time aspect of it, so, well, do you have at least two days off a week? You know, do you have Saturday, Sunday off? Work out for an hour to an hour and a half Saturday and Sunday. That's two days in a row that you worked out, right? And yeah, those are your rest days. But if those are the only days that you can reliably get in a good workout, then then say, I'm going to get that workout in, you know, and it, I, you might have to get up a little bit early because you got commitments with the kids or maybe you incorporate the kids into it. You know, so that's what I did is uh, is when on the weekends that uh, my kids would be up, I would tell them, make sure you pack workout clothes. We're going to the gym. And they went to the gym with me and I took whatever my workout was, I planned a uh, scaled down version of that for them and said, all right, you're going to do the scaled down version of what I'm doing. Um, so if you prioritize it, health, health can, can be there for you. And that includes your meal choices and what you put into your body as well. So, and then the other thing, again, the other excuse uh, that we get uh, right here all the time is the monetary aspect of it. Hey, Virginia Jiu Jitsu lessons cost money. Gym membership costs money. Guess what doesn't cost money? Looking on YouTube and, and, and looking up some body weight workouts, uh, that you can do and maybe buying a couple of secondhand 25 pound dumbbells to keep in the house. You can absolutely get moving. Uh, you know, I've, I've shadow boxed in my garage for 30 minutes at a pop, uh, to burn calories and to get my heart rate up. That didn't cost a thing. Right. So these, these are all things that you can do uh, that don't cost anything. You know, you don't have to you don't have to go to the, the big giant gym where everything's painted purple uh, to, to necessarily get a workout. You can you can do it in a, in a if it's a space. For goodness sake, if inmates can do it in a prison cell. Right. Then mm, then you yeah. can definitely find some place to do it in your home or in your backyard. Back of your truck. Yeah. But yeah. Back, <laughs> let's, yeah. Uh, some but let's, some place. Let's, right. Let's face it as a guy who I never worked out when I was in a plumbing truck. Um, mm -hmm. I actually went, went, had to go to rehab, uh, mm. for, for an opiate addiction and picked it up in there and con continued as part of my ongoing treatment as a result of that. Um, and just have kept it going. But as a, as a, you know, full time plumber in a truck, I was, I could buy a set of dumbbells. I was going to use them for a week. I could find some YouTube videos, I'd probably stay on it for maybe the first day and then I'd be able to do it again. But when you said the jujitsu classes, one, I have, I'm going to pay for two of my kids to be in jujitsu. That's not expensive. It's really, really not expensive at all. And if you can't find um, a way to, to cut out enough, it's just in, in what we spend as contractors and, you know, Slushies and big bags of chips between calls in a month, you could probably squeeze out your, you know, gym membership. Or I like I like the combat sports thing because you become part of a community, mm -hmm. and it takes probably weeks. I've seen it with both of my kids where in the beginning they didn't like going, they they were too shy, it was uncomfortable. But within a month, they knew. 90% of the people by first name and they couldn't wait to get there with their friends and their new community and get better and improve. And they're in the backyard practicing on their friends, you know, in, on the weekend. And it just became like the adults and they're part of who they are. And your fitness level explodes as a result yeah. of something like that because you're... And it, when and you're it's function, it really is functional fitness too. In, in its truest form, it's functional fitness because you're, it's, it's fitness that revolves around simulated murder. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, it's, it's good cardio on that mat and it's, and you're, I, I see like there's a lot of stretching. The, the warm up that is done in the beginning is all stretching and, and, uh, 
conditioning and what do they call that shrimping, which I actually do myself, so I'm not in there with them. Yeah, it's just like warming everything up, the core and like core strength. It's a lot of it's a lot of what you would get at a gym, and then what you would get by you know shadow boxing in your garage. Um, you're building strength. You're you're burning fat. You're building yourself into a community of really cool people. Actually, a lot of law enforcement uh, I know that that I, that I get to uh, get to know as a result of being in that gym. But mm-hmm. just really, really cool people trying to get better at something, and you—it doesn't take long at all before you cannot wait to get there. And everybody gets there pretty shy and uncomfortable, and just you know, weak in their they feel like they're at home, maybe more so than home. Yeah, Ab- absolutely true. Absolutely true. You know, it's you mentioned that you know there's you nickel and dime yourself out of the money that you could put into. Uh, you know, whether it's a gym membership or buying, buying a gi and, and, and signing up for jujitsu. That's a hundred percent true. Um, we're also, so I have a little bit of a phone addiction to my phone. I'll, I'll be completely honest. Like, like most people in 2021, I've got a little bit of difficulty putting this thing down. Um, but if, if somebody's listening to this and they've kind of already identified that in their cell, you know, it's, I'm kind of, first thing I do, when I stop the truck and I get out, is I pull out my phone and I check it. You know, first thing I do whenever I, 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 I sit down for a meal and it's on the table next to me, screen up, you know, it's, it, I'm, I'm on my phone a lot. I've got a little bit of a, a dependence and addiction on that phone. Okay, great that you identified that. And yeah, you do probably need to scale that down. But I would also say that that's the type of person that can benefit if they're thinking about exercising is getting one of the mini heart rate monitors that are out there, and I'm not going to plug any particular brand, that you know has an app that goes along with it that you get to see what your results are, right? You see what your heart rate zones were and everything else. That's really important for anybody in fitness. I talk about it in, in, the, in the chapter on fitness how important that is. But there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a side reason for this as well, is because you're already addicted to the dopamine hit that things on your phone are giving you, whether it's apps or games or whatever, if you incorporate your heart rate monitor into that same uh, that 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 same modality, then uh, it becomes easier because then it's seeing that feedback on the screen and going, "Wow, I, I worked out. I, I was working out for 57 minutes and I burned 1,100 calories. And wow, look where my heart rate zone was. Right. So this is like you know you, this is like putting your three initials up." Uh, when you when you beat when you beat the boss <laughs> screen on Galaga, yeah, right? right. It, it's a li- it's a little bit of a boost, uh, and I'm dating myself talking about Galaga, but um, so I you, you have to do that. It's important for many reasons. You can't you can't manage what you don't measure. So a heart rate monitor is important, but in in our society, I found out that there's kind of a secondary reason that it works, and, and it's for that reason that people have that screen addiction, and this this is one of those areas where you can kind of capitalize on that screen addiction. Yeah, that's well said, Doc. Uh, the gamification of, of things in our our current, uh, you know, uh, how people are on their phones and video games and those types of things, I think only serves to make it better because it does create a certain level of like fun and attractiveness. Like you said, posting your initials mm-hmm. up on a scoreboard or, I mean, you're already going to be looking at your phone, so you might as well see that uh, you've been lazy today. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, right. And, you know, make changes, right? Yeah, Nordic Track and Peloton have really seemed to tap into that market with the gamification that you mentioned, Nate. Because um, my wife has the Nordic Track version, and I'll be, I'll just grab it every now and then, and like put Yellowstone on the TV in front of it, you know, and catch an episode while I'm while I'm pedaling. And um, what I'll notice is that there's 800 there, people there ahead be, of you, Brian. Uh, yeah, well, there might be 1,500 people that are kind of doing this thing, and, I, and I'll look, and I'm in 700th place, yeah. and I'm like, and what are the what are the odds that it's a bunch of Dr. Mike Simpson ahead of me? Not, not great. <laughs> I'm guessing it's a bunch of housewives, and I'm getting I'm getting eaten alive here, so I have to get going and try to like make top 10 or top 100 or whatever. But it but it actually works. I look down at that screen, and I'm like, oh, you guys ain't beating me. No, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's. Uh, all of this, and that's you know the, the a big part of the addiction that comes, especially with people addicted to the social media apps, is you're addicted to the likes, 
you're, you know, the, the likes and the comments, right? It's on a, on a level that you don't even fully realize this is like a game to you. So it's every time somebody likes your post or comments on your post, there's a part of your brain that, 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 that you get a dopamine hit because that's a reward center. Like you're getting points is what your brain is telling you. So, and that's what the great thing about fitness apps is you can, is you, you're tracking your points. So then you start to want more points. You start to, I start, I started wanting to wear my fitness monitor, my heart rate monitor all the time because then I'm going to get more points, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, and the, the app that I use, I use, and I'll tell you which one I use, even though this isn't a specific endorsement, I use MyZone. It's, you go from, uh, you get iron status and then you get bronze status and then you get gold status and I'm on my way now to platinum status. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's a goal, right? That's an, that's, that's something that I'm striving toward. So I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm striving for that dopamine hit of getting that, that next level. Yep. All right, doc. So I, I looking over your resume here again, I mean, you've literally deployed to 17 different countries. You've jumped out of, I'm sure hundreds of airplanes. You've been a sniper, you're a, you're a board certified emergency medical physician. You do all these things. And yet you wrote a book, not about all those experiences, but about honing yourself after 40. Let's, let's jump into the book and why you chose that topic. Before we do, I want to, I want to mention one thing about the book, despite the fact that it's very short, uh, relative, I don't, I don't love reading. Um, books. I, I love audio books. I love podcasts. I, this is all, pretty much all I do. Um, I'm very well known for having one headphone in my ear at work. You know, I'm, I'm behind a desk now, but I'm I'm catching podcasts and audio books pretty much all day when I'm not interacting with people. Um, but I couldn't find your book on Audible, so I I uh, ordered a copy on Amazon and uh, and read it. It was a it was a short read, and it was one of those for a guy like me who doesn't read a whole lot gave me a uh, dopamine hit of my own and an extra point for actually getting through a book in like two and a half days, which is, uh, <laughs> probably means about two hours for Nate, but um, <laughs> I'm not a, not a, a fast reader if I'm, when I'm really trying to take everything in and get a lot out of it. But for a short book and a simple read, that really gives you a rush of, uh, man, I really accomplished something. It has a lot in it. It's very, you know, it's a, small meal but it's very uh nutritional like liver or something yeah it's, um, it's I, uh it's it's a it's a chicken breast it's a it's a nice uh chicken breast with some brussels sprouts <laughs> yeah exactly you're getting you're getting not a ton of calories but a ton of nutrition and that's right. exactly what what i and i think a lot of our audience are looking for in a book so jump on amazon check it out honed um finding your edge over 40 before we get too far and I will be writing you an Amazon review. I was just waiting to release the show because I'm absolutely going to plug the episode in the review. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Hey, great. That's, that's, that's what, as you should. As you should. Thanks, buddy. So yeah. I'm taking that as your permission. I appreciate it. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> so why why the book, Doc, and why the subject? Yeah, so uh, this was something that I had to navigate for a while because I, I went uh, – I, I graduated – medical school, uh, at age 40, I was a 40 year old intern and, uh, my body did not do really well. Uh, my intern year, I gained a lot of weight. Uh, I felt awful, um, you know, working crazy shifts and, uh, eating a lot of junk on the fly, uh, things I'm, I'm sure listeners can identify with. And at age 40, you know, when I would get some time, that I can, okay, I can exercise now. And, you know, I got a few days or whatever. Uh, getting back on the horse was, was harder than it had ever been before. My body just wasn't springing back like it used to. So I started having to look at, you know, okay, I've never really looked. Nutrition was the first thing that I, that I looked at. And then, uh, and then being limited on time, having a smart way to work out that was going to maximize the time that I was working out. Uh, you know, not what I had learned in the military about, okay, every workout is a, is a five mile run and then push ups and sit ups, you know, you know, figuring out a better way to work out. So I, I started doing this and kind of building the building blocks around age 40. And then 
that you know segued into me doing my own research into things like supplementation uh, and you know rest and recovery and all these other things. So I started building up all this information in my database, and little by little, I was talking about it. You know, fast forward to, to when I started the Mind the Warrior podcast. Little by little, I was I was talking about things like that, and I started to notice those are the things I got all the emails about. Um, you know, not necessarily talk, you know, you know, interviewing a, you know, former, uh, Delta Force operator talking about some really cool mission that, that they went on. Uh, it, it, you know, or, you know, the, the fight companion that I did with, uh, with Robin Black, you know, all the, all the things that I thought I would generate the most interest and the most emails. It wasn't that. It was, you know, talking about these things that I'd figured out and people asking me for advice. Mm. And all the emails were, Hey doc, I'm X years old. I've been thinking about doing Y. What What are your thoughts on that? You know, whether that was getting into jujitsu, starting CrossFit, whatever. Also, questions about supplements, questions about diet. Um, so I was answering these emails all the time, and I thought, you know, it'd be great if I could just have like a one stop shop that I could direct them to. Just click on this link, and it's because I've answered all these questions already. And what's funny is I didn't. That should have been right there the aha moment that oh, I'll write a book. And it wasn't, <laughs> it was, it, it kind of dropped back down to a subliminal level and I just continued on. It wasn't until uh, some years later that I was starting Greybeard Performance. And again, I should have, when I, as I was starting Greybeard Performance, I knew why I was doing it. So I should have, I should have had that aha moment and said, oh, I should write a book. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, it wasn't until I talked to uh, Tucker Max, who's a, a publisher, and I told him, I said, yeah, I'm thinking about writing a book. And he said, what are you thinking about writing about? And I, and I told him about another book I had worked on. I'd already written an outline for it. And he goes, all right, you, what about, you know, you're doing all this great stuff, you know, for, for guys uh, over 40. Why don't you write that book? And I'm like, and, I, and it occurred to me, well, I kind of already have written that book. All I got to do is go back through the emails, go back through podcast episodes, go back through my own notes where I've already logged all the data uh, some clinical trials on, on why turmeric works, why zinc is important, why vitamin C and vitamin D3 are important. So all I got to do is compile that into book format. So I, and during COVID, I did that. Um, and it, and it was received exactly the way that I, I had been hoping it, it, it would be received that, you know, from a lot of people and, you know, from, evident from the reviews on Amazon, uh, that aren't from haters, uh, <laughs> and the, the emails that I've received and the comments I've gotten on social media that, Hey doc, you, you know, you answered a lot of the questions that I was walking around with for a long time and you did it in a very, Hey, we're sitting on a road trip in a car and I'm just talking to you format and you kept it brief and you didn't do it too crazy. And it's funny cause that's uh, a couple of the critiques I've gotten about the book is, is that it's not, it's not long enough and it's not detailed enough. And it's like, no, 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 that's, that's on purpose because this is a book for everybody, whether you're just, whether this is, I, I hadn't even thought about getting into shape until recently or uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, but I'm struggling and I need, I need to refine this. You know, I, I it's not, it's not, a, I didn't want to write this. I am, I am dictating 52 weeks of workouts to you and I'm dictating a meal plan to you. No, I wanted to give everybody their own left and right limits and, and, and let them kind of figure that out for their own because they're going to have to fit that into their lifestyle. One size does not fit all. And, uh, and I think I've accomplished that. At least I hope I have. Yeah, definitely. It would, it would be a great, uh, you know, if you renamed it, a, a beginner guide would be fantastic. But right. also, like myself, I've already got the workout piece down and, you know, I'm engaged in, in uh, the macros I track and I could do better on my diet. But um, still reading the book, I, I take things out. I can't even name how many things that I, I saw in there that either like solidified something for me or made me think in a little bit different way or, or reminded me of something that I just completely forgot about in terms of nutrition mm -hmm. or for me, the, the whole um, active recovery chapter or recovery chapter was, was huge for me because there's no, I have no plans for that. I mean, zero. Zero active recovery whatsoever. And if you wouldn't mind, would you go in a little bit into the active recovery and, and kind of what that means and what that is? Yeah. So, you know, we, we've, we've come to, uh, think of recovery as, as, as a rest day, right? That we're just, we're not going to do anything that day. I'm going to walk around and I'm going to feel a little bit sore. Uh, 
and my body's going to do some healing on that day because it would kind of hurt if I if I went into the gym on that particular day. Um, but what you need to realize is that you need to be doing, most people need to be doing active recovery, which they're not doing, which means that's a day that you do yoga or you do a stretching routine or you get on your mountain bike or your road bike or you go for, you know, a long walk with your dogs. You're moving around because if I, if I do a really hard workout on Tuesday um, and that means that I caused some, some micro damage on a, on a cellular level and on a muscular level, right? Um, I, I stressed my nervous system a little bit doing that workout. So the next day is a day to clear toxins and to recover those tissues. But if I'm just completely sedentary, that's not going to happen properly, right? We, we, are, we, are move, we are beings of movement. So you need to be up moving around, promoting circulation to all those muscles that you used the day before, uh, to, to your joints, you know, getting the synovial fluid in your joints moving again uh, so you can get the, the substrate in there to repair that micro damage that you caused because that's how you're going to improve. So this is the day that you're making your big improvements, but it has to be done through some type of, of movement and some type of mental stimulation as well. You know, if, if you just program it as a day that you completely check out, then it's going to be sitting on the couch and eating tacos. Uh, and, and you're basically going to take a step back and you don't want to do that. You want to take a step forward and you want to maximize the gains you got the day before. And you do that through these forms of active recovery, which means you're still, you're still moving. You're still stretching. You're still stimulating yourself mentally. Uh, you know, going through both active and passive movement. Um, but you're not pushing that envelope and, and letting your heart rate get, you know, that, that's not the day you want your heart rate up in the high 140s or the 150s or even the 160s. That's the day you want the heart rate, you know, to, to hover around kind of your lower to mid zones. Uh, but you want to, you don't want to, you want to feel good about it. That's when you're going to, you're going to clear out all the lactic acid. You're going to maximize blood flow. To, to bring nutrients and to bring substrate to those connective tissues so they can repair themselves. And you'll, I think anybody, you know, just try this, do, do a little experiment on yourself, do a hard workout day, do nothing the day after. Then a week later, do a hard work, do the identical workout and, uh, you know, go for a bike ride uh, and do 30 minutes of yoga. And then on that third day, see the difference in how you feel in comparison and you'll find that there is no comparison that if you did an active recovery day you absolutely feel so much better yeah it makes a lot of sense and you, you were the first person i've really I mean, i'm sure it's not the first time i've heard or read about it but it was the, maybe the sim simplicity with which you explained like squeezing out and purging the lactic acid um where normally we feel like our muscles are just torn up and sore, but mm -hmm. we're actually experiencing that kind of toxicity level. And then, um, yeah, it made me like, I did a severe, pretty severe leg day as I, I have uh, my bicep is torn in my shoulder, so I'm mm -hmm. really limited on upper body. So I did a hardcore leg day. Um, I think it was the day, the day after I finished the book, and, and that mm -hmm. chapter is toward the end. And then the, uh, the next day I did, um, a lot of air squats in my office throughout the day and then just slowly rode my wife's Nordic track the next morning. And I'm like, my legs didn't even get sore. <laughs> now I just feel like I didn't try hard enough, but they, I mean, they were barely even sensitive to the touch. And that was mm -hmm. the kind of workout where I should barely be able to walk out, walk up the steps. So right. I put it to the test pretty much immediately and found, found the info to be sound. Um, so yeah, it was, that was a good learning lesson for me in that I'm, I'm one who would try not to use those muscles at all the next day, typically. Yeah. And you, you're, you're going to find that, that because you're maximizing your recovery now that you're able to do more and, and your, your gains are going to come more quickly now. Well, doc, this has been so good to hear from you. And I, I love the, the mentality that you have and that you just perpetuate through your book and through your life and sharing on our episode today. Uh, so we kind of bring things in for a landing. You know, we are coming into the end of the year and the beginning of the year. I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts, you know, January one often has this uh, negative outlook of, uh, 
I, I say negative <laughs> because, you know, people start something, oh, it's a new year, it's a new me, it's a new day. And then three days later, it's not anymore. You know, are, are right. you are you a big fan of like starting something new on a calendar date like that? Or is there a better way that you found to make adjustments, uh, in- incremental adjustments in your life to make a difference? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the of the calendar date. I mean, these are, these are arbitrary dates that we, you know, we could have been using the Mayan calendar, the Aztec calendar, uh, the Sumerian <laughs> calendar. I mean, you know, there, there's all, it, it, it's, it's, it's completely arbitrary. Right. And <clears throat> this whole new year, new you, new year's resolution thing, never been a fan of that. All, all traditionally, all I've ever seen from that is that, you know, usually there's about a three to six week period where, there's people that I have to walk around at the gym. Right. Uh, and, and, and I know they're only going to be there for three to six weeks and I'm never right. going to see them again. Yeah. Uh, so it's, so they make my life more difficult for three to six weeks because, <laughs> because almost none of them stick around. Um, and, and I, I, I think that, so, you know, let's go back a year ago for me. So I was in December of last year when I identified what, that my weight was not where I wanted it to be. And, uh, you know, 90% of people would have said, okay, all right, well, after the holidays, you know, New Year's resolution, I'm going to, and I didn't, I said, okay, I'm going to do this now. So I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to basically, you know, and, and none of them were incredibly radical changes. It was, uh, you know, just, I'm going to, I'm going to clean up my diet. I'm going to start counting my macros. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit more mindful of my gym time and, and try to squeeze out a little bit extra every day. You know, so literally the, the, and I was already working out, granted, but, but the, the micro change that I made that had macro dividends later is my coach has me start every workout with two minutes on the assault bike. The, and did you say assault bike? Assault bike, yeah. So um, you guys familiar with the assault bike? Uh, no. Does it have like some ARs mounted on the front of it and... Right no, that would be awesome. But no, it, <laughs> it sounds it, like uh, something your your buddy Tim would have designed for sure. <laughs> right, totally. Right, yeah. Tim has it yeah, by definition. Any bike Tim is on is an assault bike. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, the, the assault bike, uh, you know, Rogue makes them. There's a couple other companies that make it. They have the arms that move as well, so you're not holding stationary okay, yeah. uh, handlebars. You so your your hands and your feet are moving, right? And, and it's got a little. It's, it's got uh, a little screen on it. So it tells you, you know, what your output is and everything. And again, my, you know, my coach was like every day, my workout would say warm up two minutes, assault bike, easy pace. And what I decided to do was I'm going to do five minutes on the assault bike. And I'm going to tr- I'm going to try to do at least 10 calories a minute, which isn't a, a monumental amount. Right. Whereas before I was kind of loping along at a seven to eight calorie a minute pace for two minutes and then getting off. You know, not even sweating yet, but but my muscles felt, you know, warmed up. I said, no, I'm going to do five minutes, 10 calories a minute. So I'm going to up that output, right? So essentially, if you think about that, in the course of a week, that extra today, that's, that's almost an extra workout in and of itself, right? Um, so I just added that, and I cleaned up my diet a little bit. And, uh, and then I continued to improve upon that as the weeks went by. And like you say, you know, step by step improvements. Every week, getting a little bit better, being a little bit more um, uh, uh, attentive to, to to how I was doing it. I didn't wait for a day on the calendar to do that. So I'm telling you know, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, "All right, Thanksgiving's coming up, Christmas is coming up," no, there's absolutely no reason that you can't enjoy those holidays, but still start to make those changes now. You know, even if that means. Uh, you know, I'm going to get a, every time I have to stop to get gas or whatever, instead of getting a soda, I'm going to get a sparkling water. And instead of getting uh, beef jerky or chips, uh, I'm going to get, uh, you know, lightly salted almonds or something like that. You know, make those minor modifications now and then continue to look for ways that you can add on to that right. uh, as you go. Right. Um, that's going to have a more long, long-term effect because, because again, consistency over time equals results. If it's this on January 1st, I'm in the gym and I'm like, and now I hurt myself. Right. And now you're injured and now you can't work out. And now you're, you're in rehab and you can't work out at all for six to eight weeks. And that's not what you want for work. It's far more devastating. Yeah, exactly. 
Excellent stuff here. We were talking with Dr. Mike Simpson today. Uh, he is the author of Honed, Finding Your Edge as a Man Over 40. And Doc, if people are interested in learning more about you or checking out your book or following you on social media, where where would they find all of that? So uh, my, I have uh, graybeardperformance.com is, is, is my commerce site that I do my life and lifestyle brand. So I've got my, my supplement line is for sale there. Everything you, you everything your body needs to make you a savage over age 40. I've got an apparel line. I've got uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu rash guards and geese for sale uh, there as well. That site's going to be ever evolving uh, and ever expanding. I'm going to be adding more stuff to it all the time. Um, you can. I also have DrMikeSimpson.com if you just want to go and read a quick bio. You can contact me through either website. Uh, Graveyard Performance has its own Instagram account, uh, which is Graveyard Performance, and uh, I have my own Instagram account. Uh, which is Dr. Mike Simpson, D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Uh, Graybeard also has a Facebook page. I don't get a lot of traffic there, though. Like, most of what I'm doing, I'm doing on Instagram now. Gotcha. Excellent. Excellent. And, and don't forget the uh, Mind of the Warrior with Dr. Mike Simpson oh. podcast. I would I would love for all of our audience and, and particularly our employees to uh, jump on there. And you know, as he gets to an hour a week, that would be a great way to spend the summer in your work truck. Right. And, I, and and I guess I should probably I should probably take my own advice and do that now rather than say I'm going to do that in in 2022 right? <laughs> in order not to be a hypocrite. <laughs> That's true. You did say you're going to start in 2022, right? I, I did. Wow, man, uh, you caught me. I'm dead dead to rights in my hypocrisy there. So. Hey, Doc. Uh, yeah, before we let you go here, um, we came across you uh, through one of our previous guests on the show, Tim Kennedy. And, uh, you know, we loved having him on and kind of everything that what he was about and then, you know, kind of learn about you and, you know, you definitely wrap up the waste no day mindset as well. But I believe both of you actually starred on a history channel TV show called hunting Hitler. And we were hoping you could kind of close this out here with a fun story, uh, or something memorable about memorable about your time on that show and working with Tim. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So uh, what, what's funny is, you know, Tim, Tim and I knew each other kind of peripherally uh, before doing the show together. Um, but we hadn't, I, I tell people the, the, until we were on a plane together flying to Chile, we had not probably been physically together in the same place for more than 10 minutes at any given time. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, although, you know, it looks a lot like a buddy cop, you know, movie when, when we're doing that together, that was really Tim and I kind of getting to know each other. Wow. And we, we do it. We're, we're both in the seventh special forces group together. Uh, we know a lot of the same people, both in the soft world and in the MMA world. You know, we had, we had like one degree of separation and we had talked on the phone before and we had conversed before, but, um, uh, that was really when we kind of, be, we became friends and, uh, so we flew down together and uh, the episodes in season two that you see he and I together, which is the finale. Um, I, I was going down at the same time as him, but they still had a couple of things to go do uh, to wrap up uh, for an episode previous to that before the part where, where Tim and Gerard and I, and then ultimately just Tim and I are on camera together. So I didn't have it basically the first three to four days in country. Um, I didn't have really anything to do. They were, they were going off and, and, uh, talking to some people, um, you know, they had to be interviewed, some potential witnesses and people that had information pertaining to the investigation. Whereas, uh, you know, I was at the hotel. So, uh, Tim and I would work out together pretty much every day. That's one thing when you travel with Tim, he, he, he asks you, Hey, you want to get a workout in? And, uh, you know, he's also judging you a little bit, uh, when he asks <laughs> yeah, that, right. uh, which is evident, right. And then, you know, no, no pressure. <laughs> um, so they were, they were out, they had a, an early day to go out and, and, and uh, do some shooting that day. And they were wrapping up by interviewing this couple that, um, uh, an elderly couple that, uh, were of German descent who claimed to have some connections to um, some, some escaped Nazis right after uh, World War II. So they, were, they went to go do that. And uh, the plan was they were going to get back. Tim and I were going to go do a workout, and then we were all going to have dinner together, the entire crew. And uh, it's getting around the time where I'm expecting them back. And I shot Tim a text, hey, man, what's up? You know, just you know, trying to 
uh, figure out what time you guys are getting back. And he texted me back. He said, uh, there's a problem. They've become hostile. <laughs> and I'm like, hostile? Question mark. <laughs> and he said, uh, they have locked the gate to the compound surrounding their house and they refuse to let us leave. What? And, uh, what, yeah, so what I, this is what I found out later. So I didn't know this at the time. What happened is this couple's kids showed up while the interview was in progress. And they're like, who are you people? And they, you know, say, oh, we're, we're here, you know, we're, we're doing this, this docu-reality series from History Channel. And, we're, you know, we're looking into whether or not Hitler might have escaped to South America. Your parents have some, you know, they, they emigrated from Germany. They have some connections. And, well, the kids did not like, this was like a dark family secret. Oh, and the man. kids did not like that their parents had agreed to do this interview. So they went into panic mode. So they go off to some portion, and this is a well-to-do family, they go off to some portion in the front of the house and they hit this button that basically locks everything down. <laughs> and, they're, and they said, okay, none of you are leaving. And first they said, none of you are leaving until we get all the memory cards from your cameras. And they said, you're not getting the memory cards for our cameras. And they said, okay, then none of you are leaving until you pay us $10,000. Whoa. And it's like, hmm, that's kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I can't so imagine it, who were people to do that to before we get uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and I knew where they were. So this wasn't very far away from the hotel where we were staying. So, you know, Tim said, and so Tim is texting me real time updates on what's going on. And I'm out front of the hotel so I can get good reception. And I look and there's cab drivers lined up. Right. And I, I tell him, I said, if needed, I can steal a cab and I can bust through those gates and I can be there in 10 minutes. Mm. Say the word and I'm on my way. <laughs> and I see the three dots, right? The three dots. Yeah, right. Three dots. And the three dots stop. The three dots pick up again. Three dots, three dots. Stop. Three dots. And I'm like, all right. And I start walking <laughs> towards this cab driver. I picked out which cab driver I knew that I could take pretty easy. Uh <laughs> Cause I, cause I, cause getting the cab there was not going to be a problem. But then when I get there and I tell him, okay, yeah, drive you, need to, the gate. <laughs> you need to, you need to ram through that gate. Right. I, I kind of had a feeling he wasn't going to be cooperative with that. Right. <laughs> so then Tim says, stand by. And I'm like, okay, all right. Maybe I can stretch a little bit. A couple more minutes went by and he says, situation handled on our way back. <laughs> Oh my word! So yeah, so what ended up happening is they they basically called this family's bluff and they said, "All right, hey," because the family was like, "We'll call the police," and they're like, "We have a legal contract, and and we were invited into your, you know, we're much like Dracula, we were invited into your home, so we have a right to be here." Yeah. So so they said, "Fine, we'll call the police for you." And then when the police showed up, the uh, the showrunner just showed them, "Hey, we've got a contract from these individuals saying we can interview them. We didn't." You can ask them. We didn't coerce them. We didn't do anything. And uh, they checked everybody's passports and they said, do you want to press charges against these guys who locked the gate on you? And said, nope, just then leave. And, and they made, made the decision at that point they weren't going to use any of that footage just because obviously there'd been so much animosity in there. So none of the footage of that interview ultimately made it into the final oh, cut of the wow. show. But, yeah, but Tim got back, and like I say, at this point we've been hanging out together for probably two days. And, and Tim said to me, he goes, uh, he said, "Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely have the right wingman on this trip <laughs> if uh, if things go sideways." So. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, a yeah. good wingman it seems like they haven't been about any situation. Right. <laughs> uh, did you ever the, check uh, medical did, knowledge on top of everything else? Yeah. Did you ever check you, in with Tim then and ask him like? what all those dots were about at any point? Was he texting you uh, like, yeah, man, come on over. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, you know, I never asked him specifically uh, what it was, but I think it was uh, him basically updating me that, okay, police are coming. Police are here. We're talking to the police. Police seem to be on our side, you know, things of that nature. Um, but uh, yeah, it was definitely definitely an interesting time. It was gave us something interesting to talk about while we were doing. You know, we, we went over and, and did some lifting that night. There was a, this hotel. There was a gym right next door that they didn't have their own. 
um, fitness center, you, you, you got a free pass at the gym next door and we're over there working out and told me all about it. And we laughed about the whole thing. Um, actually, if you watch season two and you see the, uh, the episodes where we're in Chile and uh, our translator, which a young lady, uh, and her first name is actually America, um, who probably weighs 98 pounds soaking wet. She was the one that, that, he, that Tim said like really stepped up during that and like really got in people's faces and were like, wow, reading them the riot act. Like this is kidnapping. You need to back off. Uh, so yeah, interesting story. Yeah. I know you can't, and I don't, I don't want to plunge into another hour and, to take too much more of your time, but I, and I know you can't speak to any absolute certainty, but in, in regards to like, old German families in Chile and, you know, that area and Colonia Dignidad and all that, mm-hmm. is there, in your experience, is there much of a chance that there's a, a German family there of, you know, of any significant age that did not, um, that, that isn't an escaped Nazi family of some sort or uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, uh, in all of South America, you've had, uh, you know, German uh, emigration to South America has been an ongoing thing since after the First World War. So there's a lot of families down there, well established. Um, when I was in, um, I believe it was in uh, Paraguay, I actually found there were, there were multiple families where uh, they had emigrated, had children, and then when World War II kicked off, their got on a boat and went back to Germany, went back to a country they'd never, they never weren't born in and had never physically been to, uh, to enlist and fight in World War II. So um, it's interesting. But, I mean, there's also many families that fled because they didn't want to be involved in that. They didn't, they were not aligned with what the Nazis were doing. Um, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that. They saw the writing on the wall. They saw another World War was coming and they wanted to leave. Um a lot of them, a lot of them got away, and a lot of them uh, escaped justice. I mean, that's that's evident. A lot of them made their way into government in other countries. Um, a lot of them went underground, and you know, continued to embrace that ideology in different ways. What a great wrap up story for us, uh, Doc Simpson. We appreciated having you on the show today. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your schedule to encourage our listeners. Uh, to take on that warrior mindset and to really, you know, become that savage, whether you're over 40 or you're eventually going to become 40. It's a message that we love and we appreciated you sharing it with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, it was great, great to talk to you in person. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Hey, that's a wrap for us here at the Waste No Day podcast in this episode. We hope you appreciated your time listening to Doc Simpson, and it was great hearing from him and his stories, as well as the mindset that he carries. And I think it's one that we can really choose to embody here. I love that idea of cleansing the truck, cleansing the environment, and really pushing out the things in there that cause the bad habits, that cause us to kind of uh, waver on our determination. Whether that's, you know, listening to educational material or just making yourself better or dieting or technical expertise or training yourself in communications, there's always ways to get better. And and I find that if we can remove the distractions from getting better in those things, the attempt to get better will be easier. Still going to be hard because we still need to be challenging ourselves, but removing those distractions can help in making that decision a little bit easier. And we hope that this podcast has made your life a little bit easier in terms of uh, helping you improve, but it's not easy and it is always a challenge. And that's what we want to be here. We want to be challenging you. Today, it was on perhaps diet and mindset. Tomorrow, it might be on technical skills and communication, but whatever it is, we want you to be getting better, to look in the mirror and find the better version of yourself, to find that next level and to wake up each morning and choose to waste no day.